Exoplanets in Your Backyard with Alison Johnson from National Geographic. Welcome back to The Cosmic Companion. I'm James Maynard. This week, we're going to look at exoplanets in your backyard. Or at least get a small idea of what it might be like to visit these worlds and, you know, survive. So later in the show, we're going to be talking with Allison Johnson. She is senior editor at National Geographic. We're going to be discussing their new release, Complete National Parks of the United States, and explore how some national parks could give us a small taste of life on distant worlds. Astronomers currently know of a little over 5,000 worlds orbiting stars other than the Sun. These range from small, hot, rocky planets huddling close to their star to massive Jupiter-like worlds. This largest class of planets could themselves be encircled by families of moons, some as large as Mercury or even the Earth. Now, you may occasionally hear reports telling of the discovery of a so-called habitable or even a temperate planet orbiting another star. This is relative. Even the most temperate exoplanet is no place for human habitation. Around 100 light years from Earth, a cool star named LP 890-9 is accompanied by at least a pair of relatively homey exoplanets discovered recently using the Test Space Telescope. Now, LP 890-9b, the innermost of the planetary duo, is about 30% larger than Earth and a year there lasts just 66 hours. Why, on that world, I would be... old. Its close proximity to even a relatively cool star still makes this world too hot for liquid water. If this appeals to you for future vacation plans, but you're looking for somewhere on this planet, head on out to Death Valley in California. In 1913, this plane hit 134 degrees, and the region recently peaked at 130 in 2020. The larger, more distant brethren, LP 890-9C, is about 40% larger than Earth, and a year there lasts roughly eight and a half days, receiving about 90% as much energy from the, its star as the Earth does from the Sun. This world sits within the Goldilocks zone, where temperatures are neither too hot nor too cold for liquid water to exist on their surface. It's just right. If LP 890-9C sounds appealing, you might head up to Alaska to experience a guided tour exploring the Northern Lights. From the middle of May to the end of July, Fairbanks also experiences a midnight sun season something you also get on the sunny side of LP 890-9C. However, the oxygen in Alaska, cold as it is, is still pretty helpful. Next up, we talk with Allison Johnson, senior editor at National Geographic. We're going to be talking about their new release, Complete National Parks of the United States, and talk about, you guessed it, exoplanets. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we're delighted to be joined by Allison Johnson. She is senior editor at National Geographic. 
And her new book, Complete National Parks of the United States, just came out on the 18th of October. And we are going to look at some of the ways you can explore exoplanets in your own backyard. Welcome to the show, Allison. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's a delight to have you here. Uh, so can you just tell us a little bit about the book and what is it that makes it so cool? Sure. So this is our third edition of our complete guide to the national parks of the United States. And what I love about this book, everyone thinks of the national parks as our 63 national parks, but the national park system actually comprises of 400 plus sites throughout the United States. And that includes state parks, historic landmarks, lake shores and seashores. So there's a lot to see and do and discover and such a diverse array of landscapes that you can find in your own backyard. And this book has tackled all of the newest parks, newest information about all of the parks within the national park system. We talk to park rangers and National Geographic travel experts to get the best information in the history of every park. And we've also made sure that we've include, included all of the newest parks that we have. So for instance, in 2020, New River Gorge in West Virginia was added as our 63rd national park. So we want to make sure in this edition that we have all of the updated information and all of the parks that you can see and experience in one book and use it as a guide to create your bucket list to the national parks of the United United States. That is so awesome. And uh, so how, what is your interest in this? How do you, what, were, what are like some of you, the memories you've had personally in national parks? I've always loved traveling to national parks. It's an experience. I'm grateful to my parents for instilling in me, you know, as a child, that was what we did. We went on vacations into the great outdoors and explored what was out in our natural environment. Some of my favorite memories um, I went to Yellowstone in the dead of winter when there are feet of snow on the ground and, you know, but that meant there were fewer crowds and the wildlife was a little more out and free while we were there. And we did experiences like snowshoeing and snowmobiling rather than hiking. And it was just a beautiful way to see the parks. I've also gone to Zion National Park and Bryce Canyon in Utah, where I've had great experiences. And Bryce, I watched the sunset on sunrise on a horseback ride. And so there's just so much that you can do while you're in the parks that will create lifelong memories for you and your families and your travel companions. Wow. And so I just want to briefly touch on this. It seems to me, to me, nature and natural areas like our national parks really feel like it connects. It's a way of connecting with the universe. I mean, we're all made of star stuff and yeah, here we are celebrating other star stuff. Exactly. I think it's a reminder of how small we are on this planet sometimes and how much diversity there is out there. No national park is the same as another, and you'll find different species of plants and wildlife, different animals, um, everything from the redwood giants that will never, you'll never feel smaller than standing next to a redwood or a sequoia tree. Mm, I've so, been in your woods. It's yes. impressive. <laughs> It's impressive and it just reminds you of our place in this world and how much there is to appreciate about the planet we live on because there's a little bit of everything in these parks and we're all connected to it and it's why we're preserving them and we're so passionate about saving these spaces. Mm, that's wonderful. So speaking of connecting, uh, we now know of over 5,000 planets orbiting other orbiting other stars and they come in all sorts of shapes and forms and conditions. And like, we're not likely any of us to, you know, find ourselves on an odd exoplanet, but if we want to find experience something like those worlds in our own backyard, I'm going to run you through three different conditions and okay. like you get your opinions of where we can see this best. First, we're my hometown in Tucson desert. Okay, world. so one of my favorite desert parks, and it's not in Tucson, I'm sorry, oh. but it's, <laughs> it's Death Valley National Park. And mm. one of the reasons I find it fascinating, they have this phenomenon mm. called, they have sliding rocks there that seem to move on their own. Mm. And I just read a paper about that. 
they yeah. figured out how that happens. Yeah. It's yeah, really fascinating. And if you catch yeah. it, you'll be like, what is happening? Are these rocks coming alive? But it's shifting of plates and movements of the earth are causing these rocks to slide across the desert. And you can see their trails as you look into the desert. Mm. So Death Valley is definitely a unique one to get to if you want a desert landscape. All right. And how about just the opposite? A water world. A water world. All right, that I'm going to bring you to Florida. And there's lots of different water worlds in Florida, as you can imagine. If you want to see a water world with wildlife, Everglades National Park seems like an obvious choice. You're not going underwater there. You're going over it. You're going to be in an airboat and you're going to explore the water on this airboat. And that's where you can see alligators and other wildlife that live in these Everglades marshes. But if you want to go underwater, Dry Tortugas National Park in Florida is the place to go. The majority of the park is actually the reef system that is underwater. So you can go, so cool. you can take a glass bottom boat tour there. Or if you're able or willing, you can scuba or, snor or snorkel in this waterway system. And you can see the life that lives under the water in this park. Awesome. Awesome. Last one, Volcano World. Oh, volcano world. So I think the best place to do volcanoes is to go to Hawaii's uh, Volcano National Park. It actually a few years ago was disrupted by a volcanic in, um, eruption. So there are still very active volcanoes in Volcano National Park, and they are constantly taking over. Um, and a reminder that we are at nature's Beck and call. And so mm. the park actually had to close down a lot of areas because of volcanic activity. Um, but now it's back up and running and it's really cool. There are parts of the park where you're walking through lava tubes, where you're seeing lava fields with these crazy black rooted trees that pop up. And then if you make your way to the end of the park, right on the coast, you can actually watch lava spill into the Pacific ocean. And you see that creation of new land happening in live real time action of a lava spill, the fire hitting the water, and then it hardening into black lava, um, wow. lava stone that you're familiar with. And it's definitely worth seeing. It's definitely worth going to. It's one of my favorite parks in the country. Awesome. And finally, what's next for you? What's your next oh, project? man. Well, I've actually become fascinated with the areas in Michigan that are state parks, and they have really cool ones up in Michigan that really seem worth doing. They have Isle Royale National Park, but one that I'm really excited to get to is Sleeping Bear Dunes on National Lake Shore. And it's a really cool, different kind of beach experience. You have huge sand dunes on a lakefront and then the lake is entirely free of motorboats. So it's really calm and quiet and you can go out in a kayak and really just find peace out on the water there. So I'm excited to see it next. That's beautiful. Well, thanks so much, Allison. It was great having you on the show. Thank you so much for having me. And that was Allison Johnson, Senior Editor at Na National Geographic. Check out her new book, Complete National Parks of the United States, third edition. Now, here's a hot subject. Let's talk about lava worlds. Exper exoplanets with surfaces still bubbling with lava. Red lava. Mauna Loa, the largest active volcano on Earth, uh, came back to life during the night of Sunday, 27th of November. This was the first eruption from that mammoth volcano since 1984. Now, for those of you trying to remember, this was the year that the Apple Macintosh computer went on sale. Every high school student in the U.S. was made to read the only work of George Orwell most of them would ever read. And 36 pop musicians and Sting sang on Do They Know It's Christmas. Exoplanets far from their sun, large enough to hold on to significant atmospheres, could form ice giants, similar to Uranus or Neptune. You're hoping to stay for a few days in the frozen expanse of a Lindsay Sterling video. Ah, I'm not gonna stop you. Head on out to Iliasat, Greenland. While you're there, check out the fjords. Tell them James Maynard from the Cosmic Companion sent you. I mean, they don't know me or anything, but it's a conversation starter. 
Human beings are not likely to reach planets around other stars anytime in the near future. Aww. However, we can still get a taste of them much closer to home. Next week on The Cosmic Companion, we're going to be exploring the winter sky in the first of a two-part series. In part one, we'll examine what can be seen in the skies of winter using just your eyes. We welcome Andrew Fizikas, Nat Geo's night sky guide, back to the show, guiding us around the wonders of the winter tide skies. We're also going to be giving you tips on watching the Gemini meteor shower, which is happening on the 14th and 15th of December, maybe the world's greatest display of shooting stars. And I'm going to show you how to, how to see it. So winter is often considered the best and most beautiful season for stargazing. Also, it's the coldest. So, you know, there's that. <laughs> But make sure to join us starting on Saturday, the 10th of December. If you enjoyed this episode of The Cosmic Companion, and you did, right? I mean, you did. Please share, like, love, boost, comment. You know what? Just social media the heck out of this thing. It'd be much appreciated. Clear skies. <laughs>